and he wants to understand the personality of Wilson that has shocked him in some way, intrigued him, and so he took the opportunity of having himself some personality problem to visit Freud, to ask to become his patient, and as he was already writing a play on Wilson, he probably exchanged a lot on Wilson during the sessions he had, the sessions he had with Freud on his coach. I'm Scott R. Anderson, and this is the Lawfare Podcast for May 22nd, 2023. In November 1919, President Woodrow Wilson came out in opposition to a compromise that would have resulted in Senate ratification of the Versailles Treaty, and thereby put the nail in the coffin of an international agreement that he had spent months negotiating and would have secured U.S. participation in one of his greatest legacies, the League of Nations. Wilson's self-defeating decision shocked many who had been involved in the treaty negotiation, including a young diplomat and journalist named William Bullitt. Deciphering what about Wilson's psychology led to such a monumental decision became an obsession for Bullitt, one he pursued with an unlikely partner, Sigmund Freud, the father of modern psychoanalysis. Yet the original text they authored on the subject remained unpublished for decades, as Bullitt pursued a career in diplomacy and politics until it was finally unearthed in 2014 by scholar Patrick Vail. Vail's new book, The Madman of the White House, tells the unlikely story of the bullet Freud analysis of President Wilson and the lies it intersected with. He joined me to discuss Bullitt's exceptional life and career, what he and Freud truly thought of one of our most complex and controversial former presidents, and what it tells us about how we should think about the role psychology plays in the modern presidency. It's the Lawfare Podcast for May 22nd, Patrick Vale on the Madman in the White House. So Patrick, I am really excited to have you here to discuss this new book that came out uh, just in the past few days that you've written. It is a really fascinating read and a challenging project, it seems like to me, because it, it is, to, to frame it one way, to think of it structurally, it really is a, a biography of a biography of sorts. And more than that, it is a very eclectic biography of a very eclectic biography, both of which are methodologically approaching the conventional uh, task of writing a biography with certain other tasks and operations and methodologies that are wrapped up into it um, that are a little unusual. I'd like to start with your story with this project because it seems like a, a bit of fortune that led you to encounter this book. Tell me a little bit about first your experience and your history with the Bullet biography of Wilson, the Bullet Freud biography, and then the discovery you made that led to this project. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Scott, for having me. In fact, I'm teaching at Yale Law School since 2008 and preparing my term in the summer of 2014. I enter a used bookshop in New York City and find the Bullet Freud biography of Wilson that has been published in 1966. And as a student of France, in France, I read the French translation in the 70s. I liked it. I thought it was an attempt to understand something we do every day to think about the psychology of our leaders by the father of psychoanalysis. It was not a perfect book, but I liked it. And suddenly I found the original American uh, publication. I buy it six dollars. I come back home. I opened the book and suddenly the name of Edward House, was the main advisor of Wilson, comes back to my mind. And I was just about to publish the letters, the article, Clemenceau, who was a premier of France during the First World War, has written as a young journalist in Washington and New York when he was 25, between 1865 and 1870. And in the, the peace negotiation after the First World War, he became friend with House. So I was working in his correspondence, which were at the Yale archives. So I said, maybe there is a bullet document in the Yale archive. I type bullet name on the search engine of Yale and find that all bullet papers are there. Hundreds, of, hundreds of boxes, it sounds 300 like. 300 of boxes. Amazing. And then immediately... I found boxes where you have Freud handwritten in Gothic German because they were working together on this book, this biography of Wilson. Few weeks later, while doing continuing my research, I found the original manuscript. Why I, I immediately felt it was the original manuscript? Because at the end of each chapter, 
it was signed by the two authors, personally signed. Something you don't have in the in the one which was printed. And I compared the two and find that the original has been cut and revised 300 times. What should I do? Announce publicly that I found a Freud manuscript, I would have 50 minutes of publicity in the world, that was over. I said, I need to understand how they wrote this biography and why Pellit revised it, cut it, before publishing it a few weeks before his death in 1966. And for that, I needed to do something uh, I didn't know anything about, to work on the tr negotiation of the Treaty of Versailles from the U.S. point of view. I had to go through Bullitt biography because Bullitt was a young diplomat working with Wilson in Paris and before Paris at the State Department. And immediately I discovered I was ignorant on major facts of the Treaty of Versailles. First, I didn't know that as much as you can say that the League of Nations preceded the United Nations, there was a NATO that preceded the real NATO attached to the Treaty of Versailles. There was a Treaty of Defense that was signed by the President Wilson and Lord George as Premier of the British Empire in support of France in case of a German attack. And for France, that was the most important part of the treaty. Secondly, I didn't know that at the end of the ratification process in the U.S., it is Wilson who ordered the Democrats to vote against the treaty with some reservation that was including some reservation coming from the Republican. Wilson has spent six months of his time as president of the United States in Paris. He was living in Paris. There was a temporary White House. It was called like that in Paris. He has designed the treaty to put the U.S. at the center of the new world order. And at the end, he ordered his fellow Democrats to vote against the treaty. And the story we are, we are told in France and I think in the U.S. is that it is the Republican who rejected the treaty. No, what, what did the Republicans want? They just wanted to say, in case of declaration of war, the president has to follow the Constitution and get the approval of Congress. And Wilson rejected this reservation. And the last thing I discovered is that there was a man who played a major role in getting Wilson agreed for very high reparation on Germany. It was the South African delegate, which was part of the British Empire, General Smoots. So all that makes me say, I don't know. I have to work very hard to understand. <laughs> so I think I make the reader understand the Treaty of Versailles and what happens later in a different way through also the, the work on the way uh, to explain how Bullitt and Freud work on this man, because there, there is, a, Freud says in his introduction, let me quote him, when, like Wilson, a man achieves almost the exact opposite of that which he wished to accomplish, when the pretension to free the world from evil ends only in the new proof of the danger of a fanatic to the commonwealth, it was, he wrote that in 32 before, the, before Hitler coming to power, then you need to investigate. And it is why he wrote this book with Bullitt. That's fascinating. So Bullitt, William Bullitt, the person that plays such a central role in the story. In a lot of ways, he is the main character of the narrative that you're weaving. We follow his whole biography. But a lot of it comes down to the seminal moment of his involvement in the Treaty of Versailles negotiations and, and its aftermath. Tell us a little bit, just to get us started to understand the broader story you're telling us, tell us a little bit about William Bullitt, who he is, where he came from, and the role he played in that first stage before he settled on this project with Freud. How did he intersect with the Versailles negotiations and how did he come out of it that led him to this project? So Bullitt was a son of a very uh, established uh, family of Philadelphia. His grandfather rewrote the, 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 the chart of the city. Another ancestor created the city of Louisville in Kentucky. His later ancestor came from France, uh, 
His name was Boulet. He was a, he was a Protestant who had fled the, the war of religion in France. On his mother's side, he had a, he was Orvich, was German Jewish family converted to Protestantism. Very famous. His grandfather was a very famous surgeon. Because his grandmother on the mother's side, when her husband died, decided to move to Paris with her three daughters who were not married. Only Bolit's mother was married. He traveled every summer to Europe to visit his grandmother and his aunt. So he was speaking fluently French and German. And he, is, he, he married uh, during the First uh, uh, World War and he immediately goes to Central Europe with, uh, with his new wife and they travel in the German and Austrian Hungarian Empire and he works for the State Department already. And the, 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 his articles are so great that the State Department recruits him to follow what's going on in the, in the enemy country after the, the U.S. joined the war on the side of France and Britain. And he's a radical, he's part of the young radical, he wants, he believes in the Wilson world that he wants to free the, uh, uh, the world from imperial domination uh, and to create a, a new world of eternal peace. And so he's on the left side of, the, I would say, of politics. And he suggests that the future of the, of the 20th century will be uh, with social democracy. He, he, he welcomed the Russian revolution. And so, in fact, when he arrived in Paris with Wilson, he's immediately sent as the American delegate to the International Socialist Congress of Bern in February 1919, uh, and then in a secret mission to Lenin. And he comes back with a uh, an agreement of Lenin to sign a truce between all the parties who are involved in the civil war in Russia. Wilson neglects uh, to, to meet him, and when Bullitt sees a, a draft of the treaty, he resigned from the American delegation. Almost the whole American delegation doesn't like the treaty, but they, they stay in office. He resigned, and of course it makes a lot of publicity. Freud notice him, but also the Republican, who asked him to give a testimony in the Senate, and on September 12, 1919, his testimony uh, make a, made a big impact, because not only he told the story of his mission to, to Lenin, but he he reported that uh, Lansing was a uh, Wilson Secretary of State. I told him that if he was a senator, he would vote against the treaty. So Lansing doesn't deny because it was partially the truth. So it created a big uh, tension. And so Bullitt uh, leave and decide to leave politics. Uh, he write a novel which sold uh, 200,000 copies about Philadelphia elite. It's not done. He has been traumatized by what happened. He didn't think at all that the treaty would collapse. I mean, you know, you sometimes you, you argue against something, but you think the strength of the leader will prevail, etc. He never thought it would collapse, so he feels a little guilt, I think. And he wants to understand the personality of Wilson that has shocked him in some way, intrigued him, and so... He took the opportunity of having himself some personality problem to visit Freud, to ask to become his patient. And as he was already writing a play on Wilson, he probably exchanged a lot on Wilson during the sessions he, the sessions he had with Freud on his coach. It's fascinating because it's a relationship that I think today would drive medical ethicists up the wall a little bit. But he is a patient of Freud. He comes into Freud's confidence as, you know, somebody on the couch. Yes. But they end up very much partners in this enterprise uh, of this Wilson biography based around, you know, psychoanalysis, this school of thought that Freud is the preeminent figure in at this period really is still, I think, historically um, today that has this pull, but that bullet doesn't hesitate to push back on him on. You mentioned interpretations bullet has that are different from Freud's about his relationship with his father and a lot of other issues. So he's got a very strong viewpoint on this whole perspective, despite not necessarily being trained as a psychoanalyst of any sort. And so it's very much an equal sort of 
partnership, it seems, or reads like, or at least there was a, a good deal of back and forth, not so much a uh, student-teacher relationship or a patient-doctor relationship. What is it that you think was the main grievance for Bullet coming out of the Versailles? What was the big mystery for Wilson for him that drove to this project? What does psychoanalysis lead him to conclude about why, you know, their book really drills into Wilson's childhood and his upbringing as being the source of this? That is almost a stereotypical Freudian uh, method and conclusion in a way. It, so much of it boils down to early childhood and impression of conceptions of sexuality and driving kind of subconscious forces. Was there a reason that appealed to Bullet and, and what he thought of Wilson before he came to Freud? Or did Freud really inform his sense of Wilson after the fact? So Bullet was very surprised as work when he was working with Wilson. And remember that at that, st- at that time, the State Department was across the White House. So he would, he would cross the street and bring his memo and, and talk to Wilson directly. Uh, uh, for a young uh, civil servant, it was quite impressive. And he, he had seen him work. He was sometimes beside him. And he was very surprised at how he lacked strategic thinking. Wilson was extremely sensitive to affective relation. He, this one likes me, this one doesn't like me. He was not at all working like a president thinking of the strategic, calc- with a strategic calculation. And so that was the first issue for him. Then he had an incredible opportunity. Freud told him, he came to Freud later to say, I want to offer you to write to Wilson and Freud say, I'm not going to write if I don't, don't have evidence. So bring me facts, testimonies. First of all, Bullitt was an excellent journalist. He brought a lot of great testimonies. Secondly, Wilson was talking to his collaborators, to his friends, sharing feelings some, in a way that, first of all, no president and even very rarely any individual do does in, in a daily life. He was sharing in na- his nightmares. So, for example, what put Bullitt... Uh, on the path of understanding something is that uh, he got access to the diary of House and House were taking notes every day of whatever Wilson told him. And he told him about his nightmare and he made a lot of nightmare about Princeton. I have a chapter in the book called uh, Princeton Nightmares until uh, almost the end of his presidency he couldn't sleep and work because of his Princeton nightmare. So what has happened in Princeton? In Princeton, he had a very, very dear friend, a colleague with whom he was sharing thoughts and having uh, uh, leisures and and, 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 and he was seeing every day, etc. Until his friend opposed him, uh, you know, on the proposal Wilson has as the president of Princeton uh, to suppress the the heat eating clubs of the of the of, for the students, and after his friend opposed him, he became completely obsessed with that uh, uh, divergence between them. He couldn't sleep about it, so that was the first thing. And then he had another problem, I would say, with a, another colleague who wanted to create a graduate school, and Wilson could not accept anybody except himself, uh, to be prominent in the faculty, I would say. And he opposed uh, this Dean West project cra- so crazily that he was about to be fired by the Princeton board when he jumped to politics in New Jersey. So what was remarkable is that if you look at the last year of the negotiation of the treaty and the ratification process, Wilson Breck, with his dearer friend, Edward House, uh, starting the break occurs in February 1919, and then he will not never see him, and will be obsessed like he was with uh, Professor Eben uh, divergence uh, in Princeton, and his starch opposition, the one like he had in Princeton toward the West, was against Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the majority leader 
uh, in the Senate. And again, because Cabot Closed opposed him or talk about him in a way that Wilson could not stand uh, after the sinking of a boat called the Lusitania, who uh, provoked the same trauma in the, in the U.S., Uh, public opinion as the uh, assassination of Kennedy. It's funny because uh, it was reported by uh, say, the, 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 the sinking of the Lusitania had a major, was a major shock for all the American public opinion. And Wilson, after having sent a very strong note to the German government, has agreed with his uh, Secretary of State, Bryan, at that time, to send a more diplomatic note saying we are ready to to work on the International Committee of Investigation. And when his secretary saw the note, he said, you cannot do that. So he finally didn't send it. But Cabotrol revealed that he has written and approved a more, uh, I would say, peaceful note to the German. And starting there, Wilson could not even, he couldn't stay at the same table than Cabotrol, sign a document with Cabotrol, and he ordered all his cabinet not to attend any meeting, any religious ceremony where Cabot Lodge would be there. So that was quite intriguing. And then they, they try an interpretation. And I, you are very right. Bullitt speaks to Freud not as a disciple, but as a partner, as a friend. He'd call him Freud, etc. So it's a, and sometimes, and I tell that in the book, they diverge. And I think Bullitt is more accurate than Freud on some of the issues to interpret. So we, we're now in this narrative of Bullitt's life. We're in the early 1930s now, or approaching it at least. We, we're to the point where there is a substantial draft put together. I, I can't remember the exact year 32. of the draft. 32. It was 32. 32. So by 32, they have this draft. This is the they, version they, they've you've signed. Found. They've signed it. It's Every finished. chapter they, they, signed. They, they, yeah. But Bullitt, his professional aspirations change at this point. And personal, some extent, primarily professional. And that changes the trajectory of this project. You know, 10 years in, you would expect this project to come to print where it's still relevant. But that's not what ends up ha happening. Tell us what happens in Bolt's next chapter of his life and how that impacts the trajectory of this biography. So, of course, he was outside diplomacy for uh, 30, 13 years, but he was willing to go back. And he had suddenly an opportunity because Colonel House was advising Roosevelt and was supporting Roosevelt in the primaries. And but it followed him. And so Roosevelt picked him. He had no many people for as diplomats. Uh, they were most of the diplomats were Republican. And so immediately Bullitt plays a major role in Roosevelt's diplomacy because he is negotiating personally with Roosevelt the recognition of Soviet Union by the United States. And he sent as the first American ambassador to Soviet Union. He opens the embassy. He finds the residence of the ambassador, which is still the residence of the ambassador. So, and he spent, and he brings an incredible team where you have Kennan, Lloyd Anderson, uh, many others, John Wheeler. You have an incredible team of major diplomats who will play a major role in the American diplomacy after World War II. And that is 33. And so he's got this aspiration to go into government that he's able to realize relatively quickly. But why does the biography of Wilson, the psychoanalysis of Wilson, I should say, not just the biography, why is that a problem for him? What do they end up because, doing with the project? Because what is in the biography about Wilson's personality would not keep him in American diplomacy if it's published. And Freud agrees. So, so, so he was, he prefer, and, and Freud even say he might help us get out of Hitler, etc. You know, he, after all, Freud have a very high opinion of Bullitt. And he thinks that uh, he works directly with Roosevelt. He knows Europe and European affairs. It's perhaps more important that Bullitt works with Roosevelt in these trying years than uh, to publish a very controversial book on a man who, has, who, has, who is dead and who cannot change anything in the, in the fate of the world. So that's when, when they decided to not publish the manuscript, they agreed. And then Bullitt, after being ambassador in Moscow, so in Moscow, 
it's a, it's a turning moment of his thought about world affairs because he discovers Stalinism, the horror of Stalinism, the fact that for him that for him communism is like a religion. Uh, the Christ was uh, Lenin and all the disciples, uh, Stalin and others, and they are they want to conquer the world, including the United States, and it's a big danger, and and that is what is warning uh, Roosevelt when he, you know he sent as as it is a tradition his last telegram uh, when he finished uh, his term in 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 Moscow before joining the embassy in Paris, where he will coordinate. All the European American, all the American ambassador in Europe until 1940, but it is at the head of the Europe of the American ambassador network, except perhaps Kennedy, who is, uh, is in his own one. He plays a major role, and there and and they there is a story here that you know, for example, he knew from the First World War Jean Monnet, the founder of the European Union. And he, Jean Monnet played a major role to merge in 1914 the French and the British force of uh, to, uh, to, to buy the material they needed for the war, the food, the 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 the, bond, the, 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 the iron, everything they needed, and they bought it in Canada, in the United States, etc. And he. He asks Jean Monnet. He, he connects Jean Monnet with the French government, and Jean Monnet has the idea to buy American aircraft for the French army. And Roosevelt follows this idea and orders the American, I mean, army to help the French. And when the premier, French premier, Daladier, comes back from Munich, the first person he meets with is the American ambassador, Bullitt. And he tells Bullitt, if I had 3,000 aircraft, I wouldn't have signed Munich. And Bullitt's went, telegraphed to, to Roosevelt, I'm, I'm coming. He arrived in this, at the White House on October 13, in the evening, 1938. And in the early morning, Roosevelt uh, organized a press conference and said, the defense budget you are, I have distributed, we would send it to the garbage can. I want thousands of aircraft. That idea sentence has come in his head and will never leave. And he almost fired his chief of staff, the Minister of Defense, because they didn't want to, to put so much priority to the aircraft. But Roosevelt said, only thousands of aircraft can deter Hitler. Not you, the other things we, you want me to, to order. And so the, it was, it was an incredible moment for Bullitt Carrier to be in Paris, coordinating very strongly with Roosevelt to, as to try to prevent the war. And then after the war starts, he has two most very important moments. First of all, he described the Vichy government in a way that very few people would do on July 1940, where he says the only aspiration is to become uh, the, the best uh, uh, province for uh, Nazi Europe. And then the second incredible vision he had is that he sent his Navy officer to Casablanca in July 1940. And at the end of July, this Navy officer, who would be the first director of the CIA, wrote him, I've talked to all the officers of the French army, except the two chiefs, they are all with us. We should land in North Africa and not in Senegal. And so the torch operation was sought at that moment. It's why Roosevelt asked the number two of the American embassy in Vichy, which was Murphy, to become a kind of ambassador in Algiers and coordinate, starting at the end of 1940, the landing of American troops that will start only two years later. So that was uh, the, 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 the vision but it had before coming back to the U.S. Uh, in the summer of 1940. And so Bullet plays this instrumental role in setting up the really U.S. entrance into World War II. Yes. Central role in coordinating policy towards the Vichy government, towards Nazi Germany, kind of through by way of the Vichy government. But then he has this kind of falling out with FDR. Still plays kind of an influential role 
but nonetheless puts his job on another trajectory, a different partisan trajectory in some ways. Uh, he becomes a confidant of Nixon and, and, and a different cohort of politicians in America. Tell us a little about this trajectory that ultimately leads really up to the end of his life and his return to the Wilson Project, which comes not until the late 50s, really, as he's entering the kind of silver years of his career and his life. So he's put aside. He, he was a great Roosevelt diplomat, but when war starts, diplomacy is at the ser- is at the become at the service of war, and Roosevelt didn't feel he has a job for him, so he's put aside. As you said, he has some advisory role, and he wrote an incredible memo that is still in the I would say in the record of the State Department as a very important one about what he was a war- the first who warned Roosevelt of not giving too much to Stalin in the alliance he has set with Stalin after the the invasion of uh, Russia by the Nazi. And uh, Berlitz uh, forecast that uh, to give too much will have will get a terrible fate for the European, Eastern European citizen and Chinese. And so Roosevelt doesn't follow him. And so he, he starts working with the Republican. And before that, he joined the goal. He's try, he has tried to join the American army. He wants to do something in the war. He was considered too old. The goal doesn't consider him too old. He put him in the staff of the, the only army, which is the French f- first army. So he learned in the south of France. He goes to Germany. He's incredible. And he's, uh, he's working with General Delattre. It has an impact on his future life because Delattre will be sent to Vietnam. And Bullitt plays a major role, that's my opinion, in bringing back to the throne Emperor Bao Dai uh, as a way to try to resist uh, the rise of of Ho Chi Minh and the communists in Vietnam. So at that moment, after after 43, his main focus is the fight against communism. And uh, he became really a personal friend of of Nixon, after the Algeris, he gave, he gave an Al- a testimony in the Algeris investigation. Uh, Algeris was a, one of the top civil servants in the State Department who happened to be a spy for the Soviet. And Belit has been informed by the French premier that, he, that two brother East were working for the Soviet. And he has informed the State Department in 38 or 39 but that, nothing has happened at that time. But that was a very important testimony who helped Nixon. And the Algeris affair had a big impact on the on Nixon's career. And then they, they stay friends until, until the Bullitt's death, really. They spend vacation together. They, he's like the kissing, it's Nixon's Kissinger before Kissinger. And Nixon, because we have all the record, of, you know, of the, of, the White, uh, of the White House under Nixon, a few times he tells Kissinger, Bullitt, uh, Bullitt told me that, uh, Bullitt was extraordinary, etc. So that's quite remarkable to have that uh, transcript of these uh, Nixon words. So he thought he could be, you know, he joined the Republican and he, he could have been Sir, Sir State Secretary of uh, of Nixon in 60 or of the Amer- of the Republican candidate in 48, but they failed. And so uh, after Goldwater uh, defeat, he says, now what, what remains to me is to publish the manuscript. But he wanted to publish it without creating any damage uh, for the church because and for the Christian, because he thought that to fight communism, being a liberal doesn't it's not enough. Being a liberal democracy is not enough. Fighting for liberal ideas cannot prevent fighting communism, which has the strength of a religion. Only another religion can defeat communists. That was his idea. So only Christianity can defeat communism. And as in the book portraying Wilson, there was a feature that it w- was noticed by many participants to the peace conference that Wilson f- spoke of himself like a new Christ. In one meeting, 
of the chief of government state, reported by Lord George in, in his memoirs. Wilson says, the Christ was good in defining the principle, but he failed in the implementation. So I am here to put things together and design the world uh, in a better way. So he says, uh, we, we look at each other. Who was this guy <laughs> who was, uh, you know, uh, criticizing his God, God the, the Son, etc., etc.? So there was, an, as Freud, in a language, Freud identification of Wilson to the Christ and even to the, to, to the God, the Father, that didn't work. It fails because he failed, Wilson, at the end. But that was something they noticed. And Bullitt had an interpretation of the Christ. And I think it's his interpretation because you were mentioning that he was debating with Freud a lot. And he thought that the Christ was, you know, but, uh, the Freud theory is that there is a bisexuality, there is a bisexuality in every human being. There is the main sexuality, which is most often heterosexual, which is practice, but there is another dimension that is in the inner self that exists, and that the Christ, by being totally submitted to God the Father, so being submitted means being feminine in some way, uh, become God himself, so very active and, and like very masculine, and so the Christ symbolized for Bullitt and Freud this bisexual dimension, and they predicted for that reason a, a, a very uh, a big future for Christianity, but it was very complicated. They didn't want the readers to be uh, offended by this interpretation. Uh, they had some interpretation on sexual of the on the sexual orientation of Wilson. All that he didn't want to have it published, so he cut it. And in fact, now I reveal it in the book. That's fascinating. It, it, and it's a fascinating transition for this figure, for Bullet, because we see him transition from someone who is, as you mentioned, on the left politically, a global idealist, somebody who is openly kind of associating with bohemians. He's friends with socialists. He's friends with polyamorous people. Uh, you know, you actually have a fair amount of information about his early sex life in here, which is very interesting. I actually want to circle back <laughs> to in a, quest in a second. And he transitions to become this person where he is a stalwart of Christianity to the point that he is and its social role to the point that he is self-censoring his life's achievement in a way, or at least the focus of his last stage of his life, for this anti-communist mission. And that becomes, you know, if for him, it seems to me he sees Christianity significance at that moment primarily in its role in the anti-communist fight, and he makes that the priority above all else. And it's this, such a such a stark transition, even as he's writing, you have this phenomenally interesting poem he wrote when one of his last early bohemian friends dies, actually, the, I think it was the husband of the woman he lost yeah, his virginity yes, yes, to, yes. Uh, who was very open and aware <laughs> that that's what they were doing. Yeah. He laments their passing, even as he's become this, you know, adamant anti-communist and very fervent about it, uh, a Nixon associate in, the, in that regard. There's an interesting theory that I had percolating in my brain when I read this book that I actually saw espoused in a different context towards the end, where a scholar, I cannot remember their name off the top of my head, who was, had read the 1960s version of the book, had been, I think, trying to argue, at least been probing on the possibility that it was somewhat autobiographical for Freud, that Freud was import importing certain ideas about his own psychology. I'd be curious about your thoughts about whether that might have been to some extent for Bullitt as well. Because for Bullitt, you know, you, you pull in so much about his early sex life, you know, his, his failed marriages, his two failed marriages, one a fairly conventional patrician, uh, Philadelphia elite wife that he leaves quickly to marry the widower of a prominent socialist he had become friends with and is very involved in this bohemian theme. But their marriage also has many problems. She also has health problems. Mm -hmm. um, and he seems to still romanticize and center that part of his life too much, again, that he's reflecting on it much later in life. Is there – much about Bullitt's own story that we learn through this lens that he sheds on Wilson? Is that a theme that you're trying to evoke here? Or is it is it something maybe he was trying to evoke and part of maybe the appeal of psychoanalysis to him, why he found this lens such a valuable one to look at Wilson because it shed light on his own path and trajectory? Frankly, I was also lucky to find so much on his 
sexual life and, and childhood because the, the story is that his first wife, who described very well socialite from bourgeoisie of Philadelphia, remarried after the divorce to an American composer, very famous, and start, continued to work. And in 1939, when Bullitt, as a ambassador to Paris, makes the headlines every day, she starts writing her memoirs of their relation because she says, I've never thought, I never talked of the past. Billy Bullitt was always talking of his parents, what his father said, what his mother said. I never, I was looking forward to the future. But now that I see his face every day, I hear his voice at the radio, all the memory of our relation occupy my mind. I cannot sleep well. I need to put everything on paper. So she wrote more than 300, 100 pages of memoir of their relation and of everything he told her. And I would say, as much as Wilson <laughs> was talking to anybody about himself, Billy took only to her. She was more than his first wife. He was his best friend. And he continued, in fact, I reveal in the book, to have a relation with her, even sexual relation, while he had a second marriage. And he wanted to remarry her in 1940. He... He always loved her. I think the only reason why they divorced is because they couldn't have a child. Otherwise, I think he would have remained married with her. She was more than a wife. And so I, had in the, I have in the book information on him that very few people ever had because she wrote everything. And I imagine that he told Freud about that. It's, what I, it's how I wrote the book, to, you know, to, to put it in context. But, but frankly, I was lucky. Uh, to find all this information who are uh, at the Georgetown University Archives. Uh, uh, so, I, frankly, there is one moment where I'm very impressed by Bullitt. This is when there is Wilson wrote, he was a student at Princeton, he read an article on Gladstone, and he wrote to his father a letter where he said, I discovered I have a mind. He was like 22, 20. And they tried to understand. And Freud starts an interpretation that, frankly, doesn't convince me about that he's finished, he's ending masturbation, etc. And But he said, I disagree with you. I think that after reading an article on, on the Prime Minister Gladstone, he suddenly found a way for himself. His father wanted him to be a minister, but a minister of the church. He would still be a minister, but a prime minister of his country. So he would, he would obey the father, which was a very authoritarian father, but he will find his way. And one remarkable thing is that when he's elected president, one of the first acts he's, he, he done, he did, was to renew a tradition that has been stopped by Jefferson to visit Congress personally, in person, to deliver the State of the Union speech. A very British like prime, a minister. prime minister. Yeah. So, and when he became president of Princeton, he said, I feel like a prime minister. So this identification to a prime minister worked. He could be a kind of prime minister, and he was running the country a little like a prime minister. But when the second identification he created to the Christ to run the world, he tried that, it didn't work. But that's also the theory of the book. I think in that, Bullitt was, was remarkable. What is still there is this, that he, dis he didn't destroy the original manuscript. If he could have said, oh, I don't want anybody to discover what I've done, and he, he could have burned it. But he let the manuscript in the archive, presuming that one day somebody would find it. And I was the one who found it really randomly. But he didn't want to publish it in 65, but he didn't want the document to be destroyed forever. That's fascinating. So... You know, we, at this point, we have the full picture of what Bullitt and Freud wrote together. We know now the delta between what he published in the 1960s, what he's originally wrote, and what's now out in the open. 
You close the book on an interesting note. I think it's a good note to close the conversation on, which is this question about the enterprise that Bullitt and Freud went under. Um, the idea that we maybe don't appreciate the centrality that individuals, flawed individuals play in major historic moments and political moments and need to spend time thinking about that. I think you celebrate the purpose, if not necessarily the full outcome of that task of saying we need to dwell on this sort of psychology. What are the lessons you would pull away for how to go about that, the importance of that, and kind of the trajectory of how much Bullitt wrestled with doing it. I mean, we Bullitt, despite this enterprise, didn't actually get his analysis out until well after his death, you know, 40, 50 years after his death. What does that say about how we have to approach this sort of task of of understanding our leader psychology um, and thinking about it and having a discussion about it? And is it even possible in a situation where those leaders are still active political actors today? Th- is Bullitt's experience suggest that that's not possible? In fact, Bullitt thought that the presidential system was not good and he wanted more a parliamentary system, which is very rare for Americans, even if they criticize the presidential system. So he wanted that. But I would say that I found, for the conclusion of my book, an incredible story. There was a journalist, very famous journalist in Washington, uh, who was the editor-in-chief of the Washington Times Herald, Frank Waldrop. And when he wrote, he, he read the reaction of Alan Dulles uh, to the book, he wrote to the Washington Post a letter. And let me read the letter. He says, the Freud Bullet book demonstrates how pallid and incomplete historical and biographical writings must be in avoidance of the evidence which counts in the measure of a public personage. State papers, however elegant, are no final measure of a president's influence on the lives of others. There are also his secrets, led in his soul long before he thought he could call it his own, and which he, likes other men, must seek to endure without acknowledging them to exist. They matter. The Bullet Freud study is an attempt to get at those secrets in the case of one man insofar as evidence is available. It was not Wilson idealism, but those spring in his nature which drove his pursuit that waited most in the world while he lived and which waited most even yet. No protestation but acts are what we must consider in choosing among those who would lead us, whether Wilson, Hitler, Stalin or Mao. The interesting story is that I couldn't... I've, I found the copy of the letter. I couldn't find on the archive of the Washington Post the letter published. So I could go to the Waldrop paper who are in West Branch, Iowa, where you have the Hoover Presidential Library. And I discover what happened. After sending the, his uh, letter, he had a second thought. And he wanted to wait and read the whole book, so he asked the Washington Post not to publish it. And the Washington Post editor wrote to him, it's a mistake to suppress indignation. Like fish, it's only good when it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, but to come back to the, what he wrote, it is, and to your question, I think it's a, it is a very important question. How do we assess the candidate to an election? By their speeches. We are seduced or not. And Wilson was an extraordinary speaker. We didn't talk about that. He, he rose to presidency because he was, the, they said, perhaps the best speaker, president speaker, I would say, until of his time and, 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 uh, and even compared to other presidents. So his capacity of seducing by words was extraordinary. And it's how we elect our leaders. We don't have any ch- way of checking them And maybe there is something there to think about. After all, when we, rec- when we are recruited as a scholar, journalist, etc., or whatever job we have, it's not only our speeches who are, who are assessed. We do more than that to be accepted in a company. And so I would say that maybe we, th- we should think of more of the process of selection of how we select our president. Maybe only having them in a tour or the primaries and speeches and speeches and speeches. Maybe we should find additional 
assessment, I would say, modes of assessment that we could all agree on that will bring us more. I mean, you have also the facts, of course, we can say you have done that if, you, if they have a long career, etc. But it's not professionalized. It's not agreed on by the parties to do to go through a process that is not only winning the primary of your party. And maybe there is a, a conversation to resume on, the, on that issue. Well, we will have to leave the conversation there. But Patrick, thank you for so much for joining us here thank today you, Scott, for having on the Lawfare Podcast. Thank you very much. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Please be sure to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to check out Lawfare's other podcasts, including Rational Security, a casual, lighthearted chat about national security news that I co-host each week with my colleagues, Quinta Jurassic and Alan Rosenstein. In addition, be sure to visit lawfareblog.com for our extensive written coverage of national security law and policy issues, and consider becoming a material supporter of Lawfare at patreon.com slash lawfare to gain access to an ad-free version of this and other Lawfare podcasts, among other perks. This podcast was produced by Ian Enright of Goat Rodeo and edited by Jen Patcha Howell. Our music is performed by Sophia Yan. As always, thank you for listening.